we're going to talk about regression. And regression is going to take correlation to the next level. So if we have a correlation between two variables, we can use that relationship to do something more useful, which is uh, make a prediction about our outcome variable. So in other words, correlation and regression go hand in hand. And if we've established a, that there is a relationship between two variables, we can now use one to predict the other. And this is our whole goal with social sciences is that we're trying to make predictions and then see if we're right. And so that's what we're going to do with the regression. So this is a scatter plot. Um, remember with our correlation lecture, we had study hours predicting a test score. And so when we're looking at this scatter plot, you might naturally be doing this intuitively. You might be drawing a line that best seems to fit all the data. And so you may have come up with something like this. What we're going to talk about now is that the goal of a regression is to find the best line. There's lots of ways we can define lines. And then we want to find one that seems to do a really good job at helping us use the information we have to make predictions. So that if somebody comes to me and says, I studied 15 hours, what do you think my test score is going to be? That I can be more accurate in my prediction using this line than if I had uh, no line at all. So we're going to use what's called the least squares regression model. This is a pretty fascinating model. I love it a lot. And it makes a lot of sense. There, it isn't the only way to define a line. So it's going to be the way that we're going to move forward with straight lines. But I want to try to explain what the least squares regression model is doing. When we want to draw a line, we could choose several different ways to draw a line. If you remember back from grade school days, you know, a line is the distance between two points. I could take the um, furthest point on the left and then the furthest point on the right and connect those dots, right? So that could be a line. Notice that this line doesn't really do well at representing all of the dots on the page. It does really well with maybe three or four of the dots, but it's not representing everyone really well. So this isn't an ideal line. We might find that we want to put the line near where most of the cluster of points are. So this green line now kind of follows this middle cluster here. However, it's leaving out those up here. So this isn't the best line. So how do we define what the best line is? And so the least squares regression model has a very um, methodological approach to finding the best line that fits everyone. So when I look at this blue line, there's a distance between the blue line and an actual data point. And so this is where, uh, at this particular point in my x value, I said, using this line, that your y value would be right here. Whereas in reality, this person had a y value that was over here. And so what I can see is that this red line now represents the error that my prediction line made. So if I have this error for this line, I could do this for each of the dots. So if I have several um, dots here, or data points, I would have um, an error line. Now, if I were to add up all of the errors from my least squares regression model, if I were to add up the distance of all of these red lines, do you see how those on the upper end of the line would kind of counteract the distance for those on the bottom of the line? So this would be um, here. Where's my mouth? There it is. These would be positive values because I would have gone, the score is higher, and these would be negative values. See how they would tend to cancel them, cancel each other out? This should remind you of what we had happen when we were looking at um, standard deviations. And so what did we do when we were looking at deviations um, so that they wouldn't sum up to zero? Hopefully you remember we squared them. So if I really want to know a sense of how wrong my, my line is, I'm going to square this deviation and I'm going to square this deviation. And actually we don't call them deviations anymore because we don't want to confuse what we've already learned. So these are going to be called residuals. But they're the same concept of a deviation as how a data point differs from our predicted line. So we're going to square these residuals. And then when we square them, now we will no longer have them sum up to zero. And so if I take all of these red lines and square them up, what the least squares regression model is doing is it's finding the total sum of all these red lines 
How can we minimize the distance or the summation of all of those red lines? So it's a fit of this blue dotted line and it moves it up and down in a way that finds where the distance and the total sum of all of these red line distances is minimized. That's why we call it the least squares regression model because it's minimizing these red squared lines. They have to square them because otherwise they'll sum to zero, but you're finding the best blue dotted line that fits all the data points where you've minimized the amount of distance between your predicted point and the actual data point. It's a pretty cool model, right? So the least squares regression model is finding the best line that fits everyone where you've minimized your overall error in prediction rate. So we're going to use the Cartesian coordinate system to define our line. So a lot of students didn't realize that's what this was called. But if you remember back from the day where we said y equals mx plus b, that's the Cartesian coordinate system. And so you might have remembered that b was your y-intercept and m was your slope. And we define that as rise over run. So in this particular case, this was going two up and over one, right? So rise two over one, rise two over one, over one. So our slope here would be two. Um, we aren't going to use the, the letters MX plus B the same way. You might think about why, but um, M has already been used, right? So M kind of looks like mean. So we don't use MX plus B. However, if you're familiar with Y equals MX plus B, you're pretty much on the right path because we haven't really changed it too much. We just changed the letters around a little bit to be um, a different concept, but it's still Y equals the slope times your X plus your Y intercept. So the least squares regression equation is going to look like this. Instead of mx plus b, it's going to be y hat equals bx plus a. So let me break this down for you. First, the y hat. We say y hat because we want to differentiate it from y. If I'm recording your exam score, there's going to be your real exam score, and then there's going to be the predicted value of your exam score. Those aren't necessarily going to be the same. So I want to differentiate between your true value of y and your predicted value of y. So y hat, it gets a hat when it's the predicted value of y. And you can see how my predicted value of y is going to come from a formula, whereas your true value of y is just going to come from your, um, your natural data. So we still have x as our predictor variable. In this case, it would be the number of hours you studied on for a test. And now instead of m being our slope, we're going to have b be the slope, and we use a as the y-intercept. So the concept of a slope and a y-intercept are still the same. We just change them, uh, change the letters. So a slope is still rise over run, and the y-intercept is still the value where when you set x to equal 0, where will the line cross the y-axis? So here's where the least, regress least squares regression model has its magic, is how it defines the slope and the y-intercept. And so this is kind of where the magic is, in case you want to be impressed. So the slope is defined as the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x times the correlation. So remember, the correlation tells us if there is a relationship between the two variables. If you have a weak correlation, do you see how that will be impacting your slope? And really, the slope is very much defined by the correlation. Because think about the standard deviation of y and the standard deviation of x. Can these numbers ever be negative? They cannot. These are going to be square rooted of squared values, right? So the positive and negativeness of the slope is all coming from the correlation. And really, the slope is being built by the correlation. These are putting it in the proper units. So if we were doing um, exam score over hours studied, the units are coming from the standard deviation. Because remember, correlation doesn't have those kinds of units. So the slope is really defined by the correlation and then put into the proper units by the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x. And then the other way in which the least squares regression model does its magic by minimizing the error um, that we have in our prediction is by saying the line is going to cross at the mean of x and the mean of y. In other words, if you were trying to backwards solve for, um, if you remember the days when you had to do y equals mx plus b, and you want to solve for the y-intercept. And if you knew one of the points at which 
the line crossed, you could then backwards solve for the y-intercept. Well, we know that the line is going to cross at the mean of x and the mean of y. And since we know that, then we can backwards solve for the y-intercept. The line crossing at the mean of x and the mean of y is part of the magic <laughs> for how least squares regression model works. So these two pieces here, the calculation of the slope and the calculation of y-intercept, are what make the least squares regression model work. So I want to talk to you a little bit about interpreting the slope and the y-intercept. So let's do some examples. Let's say I wanted to look at hours of sleep predicted by the number of children a couple has. Um, I want to point out that my y variable here is hours of sleep and my x variable is number of children. It really does matter which one is the predicted and which one is the predictor. So since this says hours of sleep is predicted by the number of children, then that means that this one is our outcome variable y and this is our predictor x. So let's say that we had done the math, and I will show you how to do this, but let's say we came up with y hat equals negative 1.5x plus 10. Here's why this regression model is so useful. Let's say you don't have any children. What would be your x value? Zero. So if I set my x value to be zero, then a negative 1.5 times zero would be zero. So if you don't have any children, what would you expect, how many hours of sleep would you get per night? 10. Now, is everybody going to get a 10? No, but this is just the prediction model. So my y-intercept is 10, which means that if I don't have any children, I can expect 10 hours of sleep. Now, this is where I think the magic comes in is the slope. To me, the slope is the most important number to interpret. If for each child that I have, how many hours of sleep am I going to lose? For each additional child, that I add to this number, how many hours of sleep will I lose overall? So you can see for each additional child, I'm going to lose a negative or so I'm going to lose 1.5 hours of sleep. So if I have two children, I'm going to lose three hours of sleep. If I have three children, I'm going to lose 4.5 hours of sleep. For each child I add, I lose another one and a half hours of sleep. Do you see how that's a very useful piece of information? So let's say sleep really matters to you and you're debating about having another child. Maybe you're thinking, well, I might lose another an hour and a half. Maybe that's not worth it for me to have a child, right? So that slope is really about how your X variable um, impacts the Y variable prediction and the change. Let's do another one. Let's say cigarette consumption predicting age at death. Um, and these data, I all, all of these data that on this page I've made up, um, I tried to find actual data that spoke to these stories, but of course, in reality, the stories are much more complicated and they're in thousands of deaths and I didn't want to confuse you. So I made the data a little bit more simplified, but they do follow the typical models that, that are out there. So if I'm saying cigarette consum consumption predicting death, which one is, comes first in the relationship according to how this is written? cigarette consumption predicting death. So cigarette consumption comes first, so it's my x variable predicting death. So death is my outcome variable. So in this model, y is my age at death and x is the cigarettes per day. So see how it looks different? This one said y variable predicted by x variable. This one says x variable predicting y variable. It's always important to be able to read the sentence and know which one's your x and which one's your y. So let's say my formula came out like this, y hat equals negative 3.2x plus 75. So there's a negative correlation. If you didn't smoke any cigarettes, how old can you expect to be at death? This model says 75. For each cigarette that you smoke per day, and this is again, I made up this data, but it's following a similar model, but for each cigarette you smoke per day, how can you expect that to impact your age at death? So according to the model I made up, for each cigarette you smoke, you're going to lose 3.2 years off of your lifespan. So if you ever hear someone say, oh, if you quit smoking, you've added five years to your life, that they're talking about is your slope. So the slope here, regardless of what your life expectancy is to begin with, this is saying for each additional cigarette you smoke per day, you're losing 3.2 years of life. So that's interpreting the slope.
Now, both of these are negative, so I did want to include an example where it was positive. So I looked at the number of miles walked predicted by the number of dogs. And this looks, font looks larger and that's an accident. It's not because it's more important or anything. So miles walked predicted by number of dogs. So which one is my outcome variable y and which one is my x variable? So hopefully you're seeing that the y is the miles walked because it's saying miles predicted by number of dogs. So my x variable is the number of dogs you have. So let's say that that relationship is that y hat equals 1.5x plus 2. So if you don't any, own any dogs, how many miles are you expected to walk per, let's say, per day? Two. Two miles. For each additional dog that you add to your family, how many miles will you change? You will go up 1.5 miles a day per dog. So if you own lots of dogs, you're going to be walking more. But this says for each additional dog you gain, you will go up 1.5. Now, I could be specific. If you said, hey, I own 10 dogs, I could say, oh, you own 10 dogs. Well, 10 times 1.5 is 15. So if I add that, I would say, I think you walk 17 miles a day. And again, this is my fun example. But I could put in your actual data point for X and make a prediction. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that the, the formula itself is very informative. It tells me where you start if your X value is set to zero. And then it tells me for each additional uh, point you add to your X variable, how your overall prediction changes. So um, if you add one more child, you're gonna lose 1.5 hours of sleep. If you add one more cigarette, you're gonna lose uh, 3.2 years off your life. If you add one more dog, you're going to add 1.5 miles walked per day. I do want to talk about the properties of the least squares regression model. Um, we've already established kind of what makes it cool and what it's trying to do, but these are the, the formal properties that I want to discuss. First, the whole goal of the least squares regression model is to minimize the sum of the squares of the discrepancies between the line of best fit to the y value and the actual value of y. So that was that red line that I had drawn in the previous uh, images talking about least squares regression model. So the goal is to minimize those the length of those red lines. Another property is that the line won't go through every point, right? We understand that this is going to be a straight line, so it's not going to jagged across every point. It's going to be a line that best fits all of them all together, but it won't go through every point. It might go through some of them, and it might actually not go through any of them, but it won't go through every point. The, one of the key pieces that makes the least squares regression model work so well is that the line will go through the mean of x and the mean of y. So if, once you know the mean of x and the mean of y, you know that the line um, will cross at that point. The value of x used to make the prediction must fall within the range from which the line is being computed. What that means is if you're trying to make a prediction, you have to use the range of data that you've used to create the line to um, establish your prediction. So for example, let's say I looked at um, how many hours studied predicting your grade. And the data that came back to me was um, zero hours to 30 hours. And then someone comes up to me later and says, well, I studied 50 hours. Can you predict what my grade's going to be? I would have to tell them I cannot predict your grade because no one went as high as 50. I'm only allowed to look at the range from which I created the line because I don't know what would have happened to that line if I had kept going beyond 30. So even though I might have been open to all data points, because my data only went from 0 to 30 hours, I cannot then make any conclusions about data that happened after 30 hours because the line may have looked very different after that point. So the, your, the values you use to make future predictions are bound by the data that you collected. It has to be within the same range. And a really cool property of the least squares regression model, well, I think it's cool, you probably won't, but um, is it requires or assumes homoscedasticity. And this is a pretty complicated concept, so I have a whole separate video on homoscedasticity. But the bottom line of homoscedasticity is, is the error rate for each value of x is the same. So 
go check out my video on homoscedasticity so that we can break it down even further. Um, but that's one of the main properties of least squares regression models that it requires that the error rate of how wrong we are in predicting our x variables is the same for every level of x.